Yeah, yeah, guys, I'm glad to see you too. Hey guys, this video is sponsored by ExpressVPN, so make sure to stick around at the end of the video to find out how you can get three months for free on your next order. How's this for a scary thought, right? Serious Sam 4 came out almost 18 months ago now. Yeah, just in case you weren't already losing track of the days blending together, well, there's another stark reminder of how quickly time is passing us by. Now, here we are at the beginning of 2022, and we've got a new entry in the series with Serious Sam Siberian Mayhem. Sounds great. Thanks, comrade. Though, I can't help but think that calling it Siberian Slam just would have rolled off the tongue a bit better. Is that even a question? Hell freaking yeah! Anyway, this thing's just come out on Steam and goodoldgames.com, and if you already own Serious Sam 4, well, you can even get it at a discounted price, which is pretty cool. It's a standalone expansion for the fourth game, which reminds me of a much better and a simpler time. Yeah, the long gone age of the expansion packs. You see, there was a point in time when a game would come out, and then if people liked that game, a few months later they'd release more content for it in the form of an expansion pack. What's your name, dirtbag? Normally these would be worked on by people not attached to the original studio, just with their blessing and supervision. And that's exactly what's happened here, because instead of this being developed by Crow Team specifically, Siberian Mayhem's had a lot of involvement from the fans and the Serious Sam Body community, calling themselves Time Lock Studio. And if there's anyone worthy of handing over the keys to for a long-running franchise, well, it's the fans and the modders, right? There's a group of Russians you interact with during the campaign who then help you out for the last couple of levels, and if this ain't the devs' way of self-inserting themselves into the game, well, then I don't know what is. <sighs> My friend! I think at one point, they even tell Sam that they're his biggest fans. Yeah, it doesn't get much more meta than that. We are your biggest fans, man! Well, after playing this thing, I think it's safe to say that Time Lock Studios know what they're doing. Because from pretty much start to finish, Siberian Mayhem was a really fun and suitably antiquated reminder of just how good this series can be. And it's an expansion that really feels like it's had a whole lot of love put into it. It adds in a few new weapons, a few new enemies, and a couple of new toys to play with, like airstrikes and hoverboards. Yeah, you heard that right. The level titles are references to Russian literature, films, Bertrand Russell, and if I'm not mistaken, Deep Purple. It shifts back and forth between a serious and a tongue-in-cheek tone, managing to tap into the series cartoonish and over-the-top roots, along with just dishing out an enjoyably challenging campaign. So yeah, it's a serious Sam game through and through. Now, you'd have to be doped up on a pretty hefty amount of copium to pretend that Serious Sam 4 didn't have a lot of issues on launch. It was buggy, it had poor performance, and just not overall what you'd expect for a game that was in development for as long as it was. That is a joke. Siberian Mayhem, on the other hand, doesn't suffer from any of that, and it feels like a much more polished product right out of the gate. Now, granted, I haven't played a Serious Sam game from start to finish for a while now. In fact, I think the last time would have been when I played through Serious Sam 4. But look, you don't need a master's degree in shooters to know what to do here. This is a game where you'll very quickly master the art of killing enemies by mostly holding the backwards button and the left mouse button. Also often throwing strafe left and right and the jump button into the mix as well. You walk into an area and a bunch of bad guys of assorted flavors all spawn in. Once they're all dead, you move the length of a bee's dick into the next area and then the process repeats itself. And Siberian Mayhem doesn't change up this formula at all, nor did it ever really need to. It's a simple premise that the first few games in the series absolutely mastered, and the remainder of the games always kind of felt like they were chasing their tails and trying to replicate. It's always been a bit of a balancing act between throwing enough enemies at the player to make it overwhelming and challenging, but also finding that middle ground so you're still able to manage what's coming at you. Too many enemies and it's gonna feel cheap and unfair, but just the right amount of enemies and you always feel like you've just got things under control. Making it like you've still got one hand left on the wheel as opposed to driving without arms or legs entirely. That's something I think Siberian Mayhem has managed to achieve. I just hope the fact I finished this thing on hard and not mental difficulty is gonna be acceptable enough for those hardcore fans to accept my criticisms. Well, what can I say? I'm not looking for a fight but the fight always seems to be looking for me. <laughs> now, all up in this expansion pack, there's five new levels, and these are probably gonna take anywhere from 45 minutes to upwards of an hour to get through each. Down here in Kangaroo Land, this thing is about half the price of the base game, which I gotta say, I think is good value, especially if you're gonna go back in there and then play around with the co-op mode. 
As for the campaign itself, Siberian Mayhem starts off on a lonely windswept beach in the middle of nowhere. Where it kind of felt like I'd passed through an alternate universe and somehow found myself in the Lost Coast tech demo for Half-Life 2. Anyway, it doesn't take too long before you come across the shotgun, barely five minutes in, which makes these starting sequences serve as a bit of a warm-up without being too overwhelming. We'll get to the screen being covered in ludicrous jibs soon enough, but the game's taken time to warm us up first. Come get some. This also really highlights, I think, how different visually Siberian Mayhem is to the base game, and I really like how they've used the snowstorm to limit the draw distance too. It kind of emphasizes how ball-bustingly freezing Siberia is, and it also makes for a pretty neat spectacle during combat, making you feel like you're encased in these cordoned-off combat arenas. What I noticed too throughout the game was how the weather seems to change in real time. I mean, there's no night and day cycle or anything like that, but the weather's going to frequently shift between being clear and sunny to then even overcast and blizzardy. Kind of helps to increase that sense of immersion and attachment to the world as opposed to just moving from one random location to another. Feeling cold? It's also about this time where the game introduces one of the new enemies, these guys who throw grenades, which are more or less the same as the beheaded bombers from the other games, and believe me when I say you're gonna see a few more throwbacks speckled throughout the campaign here as well. I also like that they give you the shotgun grenade launcher attachment earlier on here too, because this thing is one of the most useful tools in the entire game. In fact, it got to the point where I didn't even bother using the shotgun as a shotgun, I just kinda used it as a grenade launcher. Shortly after this you get the coach gun, the must have weapon for any serious Sam aficionado, and almost essential against enemies like the clears and the werebulls, yeah both of whom make a return. I think the only crappy bit in this opening level is a section where you got to fight these new frog enemies called hoppers, and not only can they hop around but also spit stuff at you as well. They even managed to work in a bit of a throwback sequence with these guys later in the game where you're inside these sewers and then a bunch of them start jumping out of nearby pipes to attack you. Yeah, that reference was not lost on me. But they're just not all that fun to fight because aside from being really agile, they also have a tendency to just kind of completely change their direction at random. Which for a game that's all about circle strafing and really trying to bundle enemies together just makes for a lot of frustration. Anyway, after that, in the same arena where you've just euthanized a dozen of these things, you've then got to survive against an onslaught of clears. Yeah, classic. Now, in the game's defense, you have got all the tools you'll need at this point, but the issue is that in Serious Sam 4, for some reason, by default, you can't sprint and reload at the same time, which means that every time you fire off a shot with the coach gun or the shotgun, your movement speed essentially halves. It's a bit of an unfair handicap, and it's kind of like asking someone to play a game of tennis with their legs tied together. <laughs> Siberian Mayhem brings back that same skill point and upgrade system from Serious Sam 4, and some of these are just outright essential. I mean, not even like a subjective thing. There's upgrades in here that are just a must. Riding werebulls, I'd argue, is not one of them, though it is still pretty fun. But trust me when I say that as soon as you can, unlock that upgrade that lets you sprint when reloading. I'm not kidding man, if you're going to play this thing, beeline straight towards that sprinting upgrade and you can thank me later. Okay. Then finally in this opening level you get one of the expansion's first new weapons, an AK-47. And yeah, did you really expect it to be anything else, Suka? Oh yeah. Things are okay when you have an AK. I know this thing is just a reskinned M29 from the base game, but you know what? I don't care. I actually wish they'd kind of taken that whole Russian vibe even further, to be honest. Like replacing all of the health kits with bottles of vodka, cured sausages or bread rolls, maybe put little Yushanka hats on all of the clears, have the beheaded enemies Cossack dancing or something. I mean, look, if we're leaning into stereotypes, well, let's lean a bit further. Overall, this whole first level is pretty damn good. And the last room you clear out, which is full of jump pads that both Sam and the enemies can put to good use, is just pure anarchy and carnage in the best way possible. The second level quickly introduces another new enemy type, and I don't even know how to describe these things. I'd say they're like noxious floating testicles that fire off fart gas, and they zip all over the place like they're rubber banding. And yeah, they're kind of annoying, but they pop up so infrequently that it's almost a bit of a non-issue. The whole point of this second level is to investigate a distress signal, navigating to all of these warehouse and dock looking facilities. There's a really out of place crane puzzle where you need to move shipping containers out of the way that honestly feels like it should be in a game that came out 20 years ago. Whether or not it's in there, ironically, I've got no idea, but you even need to do it again later on in the campaign. 
The real highlight though is the sequence inside a mech suit. You're simply tasked with navigating to the south, but between you and whatever the south entails are a few hundred enemies which need to be put out of their goddamn misery. This mech suit fires rockets with one arm, with the other arm being a chainsaw you can use to slash at anything that gets into melee range. And these are actual enemies you can kill, not just fake 3D scrolling models which can't even be interacted with. Now the third level almost has something of an open world feel to it. You're given this objective marker of where to head, still simply being told to head south, but there's actually a whole lot of stuff to see and do here beforehand, if you want to that is. You've got a ski do to help you get around, and this might be the only shooter, I think aside from No One Lives Forever 2, that I've ever played where you actually get to drive one. Makes navigation a lot faster and enjoyable, but it also kind of encourages exploration, because you're not forced to run around on foot the entire time anymore. Scattered around this forest are three key cards, tucked away in enemy outposts that you can acquire through a puzzle minigame. And then when you find all of these three key cards, you can unlock a hidden skill point. Oh, oh. There's another side mission which ends in a pretty harrowing combat sequence on a frozen lake. Frozen lake which comes with a kind of sliding physics you'd expect from an old 8-bit side-scroller. You also encounter those Nosferati looking vampire enemies again here too, and this time it actually feels like it makes sense to come across them. I mean, it makes much more sense encountering vampires in Eastern Europe than it does on the streets of Rome. Side Mission gives you one of the new gadgets too, gun turrets mounted to a hoverboard, which is, yeah, exactly what it sounds like. And I defy anyone to say a bad thing about hoverboards or gun turrets. Yeah, go ahead, say something, bitch. This whole area is massive, but without feeling confusing to navigate either. There's lots of landmarks which draw the eye, and the fact that most of these side objectives are connected to the roads means it's not all that hard to find them if you want to go looking. It's in complete contrast to that one forest mission in Sirius Sam 4, where they dropped you into this huge ass open area, which really seemed like more of a flex to show off the engine itself, because 99% of that map was just completely empty. Yeah, this mission is going great! I'll never forget driving for 10 minutes in one direction, only to just come to a dead end with nothing to show for it. No ammo, no secret, no easter egg, just nothing. Just utter disappointment. My disappointment is immeasurable. In Siberian Mayhem though, I went off the beaten path a couple of times and I was actually rewarded for it. At one point I just happened to come across a lone enemy sitting on a couch and listening to music while he took in the stunning vista. And you know what I did? Yeah, I left him to it. Because, I don't know, maybe in some way this poor guy was coming to terms with what kind of person he really was, and maybe he decided that he didn't want to follow a path of violence anymore. No worries. And this random little easter egg alone felt like it had more soul to me than anything the vanilla campaign could muster up. Hey boys, did you miss me? And my day is ruined. So I think you could spend half an hour on this level, you know, if you blasted through it with tunnel vision, or even upwards of one to two hours, taking in every little detail and appreciating all of the finer things like this that they've added in. I think this was probably around the first time I started to notice how good this expansion looks too. Don't know if it's a matter of coincidence or just the geographical similarities, but some of these areas gave me a bit of a Resident Evil Village vibe. They're very similar looking run down abandoned European villages in the midst of this overbearing snowstorm. Yeah, it's a pretty damn good looking game, and it almost comes close to looking like those promotional screenshots. Almost. Now the final part of this third level introduces two new mechanics, the energy crossbow and the sentry towers. Now the crossbow is really just more or less a sniper rifle, which when dual welded, pretty much breaks the game. Kills most of the standard enemies in a single hit, and when you're firing two of these things, I mean, just forget about it. <laughs> The sentry towers though are these structures that you encounter maybe like a handful of times and they bombard the area with artillery strikes pretty much forcing you to take them out. I mean if those artillery strikes don't get you, well then the rockets that both cannons on the left and right side fire out probably will. On top of that these things spawn in enemies fucking constantly and the only way to damage it is to wait for the center of it to open up revealing its weak spot, which if I'm being honest is a pretty huge design flaw. But you'll probably be so distracted taking out those nearby enemies that you're gonna miss this thing opening up entirely. So yeah, they're pretty tough to beat, but again, you do get the added bonus of another free skill point for taking three of these things out. So if you want to bitch out and leave these towers be, well, then I guess that's up to you. But just know that somewhere your ancestors are looking down unfavorably on you for doing so, as am I. Now, after moving through the kind of environments that look like they'd leave you with severe frostbite on your undercarriage, 
The next level seems to change up the climate, greeting us with a lovely, warm-looking sunrise, vast green fields, and a couple of hundred beheaded kamikaze coming storming over the hill. Fuck. And I love that little detail too, with all those birds scattering ominously. I'd say this is the most enemies you face in the expansion, only strap your dick down, because what comes next is way more ludicrous, and one of the most insane things I've ever seen in a Serious Sam game. I wrote a blog post a while ago about why I f***ing hate video games. Because this is what it does, it appeals to like the male fantasy. Yeah, this is a bit we get to drive a tank across this empty field the size of a third world country, being attacked by literally hundreds of enemies. This right here was my favourite sequence in the entire game, and I just had this shit-eating grin on my face the entire time I was playing it. And I love too how the tank has a dash move. Yeah, a tank has a dash move. Amazing. I actually went back into this level after I'd finished the game and cranked up the amount of enemies to the max to see if my rig could handle it, at which point my game started artifacting pretty hard. But even then, before my game shat itself, you can see how insanely fun this could have been if the engine could actually truly pull it off. And to be honest, isn't this kind of what they originally promised when they showed off that whole Legion mechanic? It's a really nice trick. Even when you're playing through this with the amount of enemies that are intended, it's guaranteed to be some of the most fun you'll have gaming in 2022. And there really is nothing bad that ever comes out of Sam Stone hopping into a goddamn army tank. After this, another optional side mission leads you off to a few new combat areas, which, if I'm being honest, did feel kinda crappy, only because I just don't think that combat works all that well in those interior corridor-like environments, though you can easily bottleneck enemies into doorways or a single direction, so that is a plus. There's a sequence on a slowly descending elevator, which I think is one of the lamest tropes in FPS level design. And honestly, I'm amazed that I got through this thing without dying. I tanked so many hits during this sequence, I just have no idea how I managed to survive. Followed by a boss fight inside a time lock against two giant one-eyed monsters. Yeah, not the kind of one-eyed monsters your mum likes. One-eyed monsters! After this, you meet up with those crazy Russians and help them escape the town by escorting them to a nearby train station. But the real showstopper for this section is when you finally get that ray gun. No way, dude. This toy looks great. And if I had to sum this thing up with one word, it'd be... Fuck. Shit. I mean, just look at this thing. Holy shit. It's like a handheld version of the Ark of the Covenant. It's like also a bit like the ultimate fire mode for the laser gun in Serious Sam 4, and also a lot like the power gun in the next encounter. Firing out this constant stream of energy which vaporizes everything in seconds. Kind of feels like the level designers were aware of the utter destruction this weapon causes because they attack you accordingly with the exact amount of enemies you'd want. I mean, at one point they're throwing what feels like hundreds of kamikazes at you, literally throwing them at you too. These guys are all flying through the air at once and it just looks awesome. Yeah, thanks for dropping in, idiots. The only downside to the ray gun are the moments when you're not using the ray gun. Finally, the last sequence in this level has you defending that train while they're trying to escape. But before you can hop on, you're then given the objective to kill everything. Yeah, your objective is to kill everything. And if that ain't the entire essence of this series summed up in a single phrase, well, then I don't know what is. I mean, this could have been the objective for the entire game, and I'd have had no issue with it. All aboard! <laughs> now, I don't want to spoil the final level entirely, but I will just say that you do finally get the minigun and the grenade launcher. Maybe too little too late, though. And there's a couple of instances here where I can't even imagine how you get through them without having to use some of your stashed away power-ups. Obviously, a lot of story-related stuff happens in this last level, and I'd be lying if I said I hadn't lost complete track of what's happening, especially during that ending cinematic. Guess I'll just leave that stuff up to the real diehard fans. <laughs> and speaking of diehard fans, that's really the big takeaway I had from playing this thing. It's really a love letter aimed at those players made by people who arguably understand what makes these games fun more than Crow Team does. It's still got a bit of bullshit here and there, don't get me wrong. I mean, that's almost kind of part and parcel for a Serious Sam game. But the amount of times I wanted to throw my keyboard out the window were outweighed by the sheer amount of times I was laughing like an idiot when things were going tremendously well. I guess the ultimate question is, is this really the kind of game you want to play in 2022? Damn things busted. Don't get me wrong, Serious Sam has been doing this since its inception and has been doing it very well. Circle strafing while firing miniguns and rocket launchers, and wiping out what equates to a small civilization's worth in bad guys. 
But that's kind of my point. I mean, it's still the same thing it's been doing since its inception. And here we are going on 20 years later and Sam's still at it. There's just so many games out there now, even the smaller indie shooters that are really changing things up and the way we play these kind of games. We get into a point when ground sliding, double jumping, and ledge grappling is becoming commonplace, where twitch aiming, bullet time, and stylistic moves are taking center stage. And then comes Sam, and about the only mobility this guy's got is sprinting and jumping. I mean, that tank of all things has a dash move, and yet Sam doesn't. Hating on Serious Sam for being Serious Sam, I realize is a dumb thing to do. It's kind of like hating on tennis for making you play with a racket instead of a golf club. But I guess my point is that if you're expecting anything earth-shatteringly new about this expansion, well then don't. This ain't Serious Sam 5, it's an expansion in every sense of the word. And hoping for more than that or expecting your money to somehow materialize something that isn't there to begin with is only going to end in disappointment. But I really do think the hardcore fans are gonna like this. I know I did, and that's me talking. A cynical, depressed asshole who felt that finding fun out of that fourth game was really like trying to get blood out of a stone. As far as Siberian Mayhem goes though, that'll do Sam, and that'll do. Right, so thanks for sticking around, and let me take some time to thank ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video. It's not enough anymore to just go into incognito mode. If you're going to be browsing the net and don't want people to be seeing what you're doing, well then getting a VPN is essential. VPN is short for a virtual private network, and what this thing does is reroute all of your data through a secure encrypted server, which means people can't gain access to it. It's really good for torrenting, keeping your activity hidden from your ISP, but I've honestly found it the most useful for streaming sites like Netflix, because for some reason, some of the content on there just seems to be really limited in Australia. For change to a country like the US, I can get access to entirely different movies and TV shows. You can choose from over 90 different countries with your data being rerouted through over 3,000 servers. And you don't just need to take my word for it either, there's plenty of positive reviews from users, along with bigger websites like CNET and TechRadar. Honestly, I'd never recommend a product that I don't use myself, and I've been using the ExpressVPN now for almost going on two years. So if you want to join the club and get three extra months for free, then head over to expressvpn.com slash gman and get started.